Hi, welcome to Nano Talks. This Nano Talk is a recording of a highly requested webinar that we have done on our stream system. And this webinar was about controlled in situ electrochemical growth of copper. So it's about liquid phase electromicroscopy. This webinar was hosted by me, Olaf Veller, and my colleague, uh, Dr. Hong Yu Sun, our application specialist at Dense Solutions, gave a presentation in which he showed uh, this application, the technology behind it, and some other examples. During the webinar, we had also participants asking questions. So after the presentation of Hong Yu, you will hear a section of Q&A and Hong Yu was supported by our product manager, uh, Jin Pivak. So I hope you enjoy this nano talk. So welcome to join the stream uh, webinar. Uh, today I will share, uh, talk about how to perform a liquid phase experiment and to obtain the reliable results uh, in a transmission electron microscope. And uh, firstly, I will explain the importance of liquid phase transmission electron microscopy over LPT. And then I will use the dense solutions stream system to study the electro deposition of copper in liquid. I will show you the main results. Uh, then I would like to answer the two important questions. Firstly, how to achieve LPTM results, and then how to achieve reliable LPTM results. Uh, to do this, we must understand the limitations in current LPTM technology, and then know why the stream system can solve those challenges. Uh, after this, I will show some additional application examples also important uh, results from our customers. The last part is the uh, outlook and the summary. So the liquid phase of liquid related progress process have important influence on the society development and also on our daily life. Uh, for example, the materials synthesized by using different uh, liquid phase methods, and energy storage and conversion by using the electrochemical devices, self-assemble and biological dynamics, geological process, and so on. The LPTM provides a technique to directly observe those liquid-related progress process at a nano or even atomic scale. And here, this figure shows the number of total publications and the research fields based on the LPTM from the year of 2003 to 2019. And we can see the considerable interest in LPTM, especially the obvious progress in recent five to six years. And the applications ranging from the material science, uh, energy, and the bioscience. Here I will use the electrode deposition of copper in liquid as an example to show the LPTM application. We know the crystallization in dendrite is very common in material science. However, it should be very careful consider, considered during the practical usage. For example, to avoid the short circuit, the electrode with dendritic morphology should be avoided in the battery device. But in electrocatalytic field, the dendritic uh, catalyst usually process obvious charge and electric field enhancement. So it is uh, favorable for catalyzing. In this regard, 
the direct observation of the formation process of them structures and in situ characterization of the structures in the native environment are very helpful to obtain the desired morphology for the specific applications. Here I use the copper division as a typical example to show what information can be obtained in LPTM. And the results are obtained by using the dense solutions stream system. And the experiments are performed at TU Delft. Uh, this video was acquired in hard if stem mode. And you can see the bright part here. That is the working electrode made by platinum. If we flow in the electrolyte with the copper ions and applying the linear potential ranging from the minus 0 0.7 to plus 0 0.3 volt, then we can observe the depositions and measure the CV curves. Uh, firstly, there is no deposition can be seen when the applied potential is zero volt. And then if we further increase the potential at a potential, for example, at a minus 0 0.4. And you can see the growth of the copper. It starts on the electrode surface and on the electrode edge. And this deposition involves into the dendritic morphology and then extend into the electrolyte at a more negative potential. And then if we uh, reverse the scanning, just increase the positive potential, uh, we can see the dendrites start to aged. Here it's aged away. And the copper deposition attached to the platinum electrode is aged at about positive 0.05 volt. And this aging and the growing process are reproducible. So from this video, we can get two simple conclusions. The first one is the aging and the uh, growing process can be directly observed in the liquid phase with a, a, a nanoscale resolution. Then the second thing is the growth and aging can be directly correlated with the external stimuli. And then if we look into the video carefully, we can find something interesting. Firstly, here, during the aging pro process, for example, at uh, 23 seconds, the copper layer attached to the working electrode and on the electrode surface is aged completely, but there are still some residual copper deposition left. And there is no connection between this dead copper and the electrode. So it leads to the formation of the so-called dead copper. And uh, those dead depositions consumes the ions in the electrolyte in an irreversible way. So this phenomenon relates to the degradation of the rechargeable battery device. And in the second deposition process, those dead copper can act as a heterogeneous nucleation size. So those that copper can boost the formation of more dendrites. So we can see this copper amount in the second cycles is more than the first cycle. So this is related to the battery safety issue. And those depositions can also be directly characterized in the liquid phase, including the spectrum, the imaging, in the, the diffraction. Here is the Hattif stem image, uh, EDX elemental mapping of the copper dendrite and the platinum electrode. Uh, 
we can see the distribution of the copper dendrites and the platinum in the electrolyte. Uh, this figure shows the bright field TM images and the corresponding diffraction patterns on the platinum electrode and on the copper dendrites on the uh, electrode. Both the platinum electrode and the copper dendrites are uh, polycrystalline. Uh, for the dendrites here, the two diffractions 111 and uh, 220 can be distinguished. And the indication of 220 diffraction of copper crystals, it means the at least a lattice resolution about 1.3 angstrom or better can be obtained in the liquid phase. So here are the typical uh, high resolution TM images of the one branch from copper dendrite in the liquid. Although the copper dendrite here, this is a polycrystalline, but a individual branch from the dendrite is a single crystal. And uh, we can see the clear lattice fringes. And the lattice fringe with a spacer value of 2.15 angstrom that matches very well with the 111 plane of the face centered cubic uh, copper. Here, the ability to acquire high resolution TM image in a native environment offers very valuable information to directly determine the structures of the in situ synthesized samples. In addition, we can also study how the liquid environment change affect the deposition morphology. Uh, for example, at a flow rate of 1,200 nanoliter per minute, when the potential is zero, there is no layer formation on the electrode. And uh, there is no deposition, but when we apply a negative potential, for example, here is minus 0.8 volt, and the layer grows quickly on the sur uh, electrode surface. And we can calculate the growth rate based on this change. Now, if we slow down the flow rate to 50 nanoliter per minute, uh, the mass transportation is limited. So it results in the dendrite formation. Then if we change the potential from minus to plus, so for example, here, we change it to 0 0.4 volt. All of the depositions will be aged. And this result also demonstrates the power of efficient liquid flow, uh, flow control of the stream system. And the electrolyte composition also affects the deposition behaviors. So for example, if we only flow the pure copper sulfate solution, the deposition shows a smooth layer morphology. For example, at a potential of minus 0.64 volt, the copper layer on the uh, electrode surface is very smooth. And even we increase the potential to minus 0.74 volt, the dendritic morphology is not obvious. But if we add 25 millimolar of phosphate salt, and the dendritic deposition is favorable. So uh, at a lower potential, for example, at a minus 0.64 volt, we can see the dendrite formation. And at a higher potential of uh, minus 0.74 volt, the growth of copper dendrite is faster due to the increased uh, over potential. The results show that the phosphate source is facilitate the dendrite formation. And the results also provide us a method to study how the electrolyte composition affects the electrochemical processes. And here are the takeaway messages we obtained from the liquid phase TM experiments. 
So firstly, we are sure that the liquid phase dynamics can be directly observed in, as the nanoscale in LPTM. And this LPTM also enables us to in situ synthesize or modify different nanostructures with a broad range of materials. And those nanostructures can be characterized in a native environment, including the imaging, diffraction, uh, chemical composition, and uh, also the electronic structures. Then it's also fast for us to choose the right materials synthesized parameters. Uh, for example, the potential of the electrolyte composition. And based on the results, we can study the possible formation mechanisms. And it is also effective to perform the correlative investigations. And those obtained in situ results provide us valuable information to control the synthesis of nanostructures and also optimize their practical applications. So now the question is, uh, how can we achieve the above LPTM results? So firstly, the liquid sample here should be confined between two MEMS chips and then seared with the O-ring sets. The chips are then assembled using a lid and screws. And before inserting the holder into TM, uh, it should be subjected to test the liquid in a vacuum pump. If the chips are functionalized by designed electrodes, then you can do the liquid heating or liquid biasing. The external liquid tubing can also be connected to the holder to supply the liquid flow. And the dynamics in the liquid can be directly observed through the electron transparent window area on both the top and the bottom chip. Now, everything is ready and uh, you also have made a very nice plan to start the PTM experiment. But in most cases, the results you get it looks like this. So what happened? To answer this question, we should uh, understand the challenges or uh, the limitations for current LPTM. So they include the generic limitations induced by the electron beam effect and also the system specific uh, challenges. So for example, the um, fluidic control, uh, liquid sixth control, and the possible cross contaminations and the reproducibility of the experimental results. So firstly, the reaction between the electron beam and the liquid is very complicated. If we take the simplest liquid water as an example, there are about 80, 80 kinds of couple reactions. It will generate about more than 100 different kinds of species. So right now, there are only uh, very limited simulation works to study the interactions between the electron beam and the liquid. Then if you have the metal ions in the liquid, uh, the electron beam can induce the deposition over the agent of the metallic nanostructures. And this deposition of the agent, it depends on the electron beam energy flux. The beam irradiation can also generate the bubbles in the liquid cell. And uh, the bubbles uh, can reduce the liquid thickness. So it is helpful to improve the imaging resolution. But the bubbles also create uh, additional gas and the liquid interface. So it makes the liquid reaction environment is not homogeneous. In addition, these bubbles sometimes also block the liquid flow. So for the system specific challenges, 
the liquid flow control is always a big problem in the conventional liquid holder design because the top and the bottom chip are immersed in the best top and liquid can only diffuse into the window area. And you see this diffusion process is very random and difficult to control. So the uncontrolled fluid dynamics usually induce uh, the unreproducible experimental results. And due to the pressure difference between the sandwiched liquid cell and the TM chamber, the chip membrane will bulge outward in the TM. And this bulging induces an increased liquid thickness, especially in the uh, window center area. And it can reach at least one to two micrometer scale. Here, for example, for the two golden nanoparticles in the liquid, liquid with a thickness about uh, 740 nanometer, the TM images is too blurry to be seen. So it's always a big challenge to uh, acquire the high resolution TM image, diffraction pattern, and also use in a sandwiched liquid cell. Uh, the theoretical calculations show that the one to two angstrom resolution can be achieved with a liquid thickness about 100 nanometer. But how to control the liquid thickness in a liquid cell is a problem. The using of different solutions in the LPTM also has the issue of cross contamination. So it's difficult to obtain the reliable or reproducible experimental results. Since we have so many challenges or limitations in the conventional LPTM, how can we achieve reliable TM results? So to solve the above mentioned issues, the DEN solutions developed the new generation in situ TM liquid system stream. And this uh, new system can achieve the reliable loading control. And you can also control the liquid thickness. Uh, you can also extend the experimental flexibility and uh, the operation is more safer. And those advantages reduce the possible contamination and lead to reproducibility of the experimental results. So here, this is the core technology of the system. The MEMS chip is uh, very important. We can see uh, a full set of nanocells include a top chip and a bottom chip. And between the two chips is an O-ring to seal the liquid inside. Uh, and on the bottom chip, there are three electrodes. Here is the counter electrode. reference electrode and the parallel working, elect uh, working electrodes. And there are also uh, inlet, outlet, and uh, liquid channel on the bottom chip. And the tips of the working electrode is on the transparent membrane. So we can see the dynamics on the working electrode in TM. And on the top chip here, top chip, uh, we optimize the window geometry and uh, reduce the silicon thickness. So it is uh, favorable to improve the counts for EDS, uh, EDX signals. And on the holder, we have these uh, conductive needles to confirm the reliable electrical contact and to facilitate the uh, liquid flow, the inlet, and the channel, and outlet to guide the flow of the liquid. So this is the real liquid flow instead of the uncontrolled liquid diffusion, as we talked in the conventional LPTM. And in the inlet and the outlet, the liquid is controlled independently by the pressure 
so that the pressure difference between the liquid cell and the TM chamber can be tuned. Uh, this is directly related to the liquid thickness control inside the liquid cell. The liquid is driven by the pressure-based liquid pump, and the liquid flow control is stable and accurate. In addition, we can use different gas source, for example, the inert gas over the reactive gas, to push the liquid over to saturate the liquid, so that we can create more flexible liquid environment to study. And this unique system design enables us to get the features and the benefits. Firstly, the liquid flow is controlled by the pressure pump and membrane-based chip design. And we can see the liquid is limited in the channel from the inlet to the outlet. And this liquid flow control can also be confirmed by the observation of the Florence particles movement. And this particle uh, move uh, velocities can be controlled by the flow rate and also the gas pressure. Also, the beam-induced bubbles can be removed by using the momentum of the continuous liquid flow. And the, another way is to dissolve the bubbles inside the liquid. We can control the pressure, and that's the super saturation of the gas bubbles, uh, gas molecules. And this continuous liquid flow can be dilute, can dilute the beam induced species and also provide the fresh reaction solution. So it is helpful to reduce the possible beam redolysis. For example, during the composition, if the beam parameters are not suitably choosed, so there are beam induced depositions on the silicon nitride membrane. And this time uh, deposition will affect the following electrode deposition on the electrode in a way to change the local electrical field distribution and the mass of ion transportations. The deposition can also affect the data analysis afterward. And if we have efficient uh, flow control, those beam induced depositions can be removed very easily. But it is impossible in conventional LPTM technique. And we can use this efficient flow con to control the move in and the move outside of the liquid. For example, in the beginning, the cell is dry and there is no liquid inside. Then we apply the gas pressure to push the liquid into the nano cell. The time of liquid into flow into the window area it depends on the liquid uh, tubing length, the flow rate, and the flow re resistance of the system. The obvious uh, contrast change in the window area confirms that the liquid is filled with uh, the cell is filled with liquid, and the liquid can also be pushed out of the cell. And uh, here we can see this is the gas front and the gas and liquid interface. Finally, this liquid can be pushed out of the cell completely. And we can see the, uh, living, uh, this is the empty cell again. So the series of the re relative liquid thickness change can be reflected by measure the use and the continuous changing of plasma peaks. Because we can control the liquid thickness uh, in elastic uh, electron scattering events, can be reduced in a thinner liquid layer. So acquiring HRTM images in a liquid, it is possible. Professor Niels Young's group systematically studied the LPTM with controlled liquid thickness. And with a liquid thickness of 740 nanometer, the sample in the liquid are very blurry and hard to be distinguished. But when reducing the liquid thickness to 390 nanometer, the clear TM image 
of the golden nanoparticles can be obtained. And the lattice fringe with a distance of 2.4 angstrom can be identified. We can also obtain the structural information in the reciprocal space by taking the diffraction pattern in liquid or in a native liquid state. But in conventional LPTM, it's usually obtained by generating the bubbles to reduce the liquid thickness inside the liquid cell, or by post analysis through terminating the examples uh, experiments and opening the liquid cell and characterizing the dry sample on the chip. We can also do the analytical LPTM, including the EDX and the EOS. For example, compared to the EOS spectrum of a dry titanium dioxide sample, the titanium L23 peak edge of the wet particle show obvious splitting. So it indicates the strong hybridization and ligand field strength between the titanium dioxide nanoparticle surface and the liquid water. And this video shows a typical psychotic voltammetry curves of the ferrocentimethanol solution in the liquid cell. Because we can control the liquid environment very well, and we can see the results are reproducible. And this reliable liquid flow and biosing control here enable us to study how those experimental parameters affect the final experimental results and also help us to obtain multiple results in only one experiment. The another unique capability of the system is the real modular design. And the holder components can be held, uh, fully disassembled and replaced within several minutes. And the liquid clogging of the cross contamination can be avoided. And this uh, model design is also benefit for easy replacement of upgrading. So now with this unique tool, you have the confidence to obtain the reliable RPTM results. So next, I will briefly explain some other possible applications by using the LPTM technique. The, the co-share metallic structures show improved catalytical properties due to the electronic effect and structure effect. And studying the nucleation and growth of the different shear materials on the core is important to tune the surface absorption and desorption of the reactants and products. By flowing the liquid and carefully control the beam energy to avoid the side reactions, we can observe the formation process of the co-share nanostructures. And this gross kinetics of the shear material can be obtained by analyzing the dimension change in real time. In addition, if we flow the electrolyte into the nanocell, we can observe the corrosion process of the Miller sample and found the preferred corrosion along the green boundary. Without the well-controlled liquid environment in the liquid cell, it is difficult to study those liquid process in real time with high resolution. Next, I will briefly talk about the results from our customers. So firstly, by using the dense solutions holder, Professor Nico Sumadik and Professor Joe Patterson from the TU Endhoven recorded the formation process of viscose from the amphi uh, amphiphilic molecules. And they found that the copolymer-rich phase-separated domains appeared in the homogeneous copolymer mixture and then self-assembled into uh, the re uh, resulting droplets, and finally form the closed viscous. And their in situ experimental results are uh, also in good agreement with the theoretical works, ex situ studies, and uh, cryo TM collaborations. So based on this video and their results, they proposed a new pathway of the viscous formation. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Cookman and Professor Wushu Bangert from the 
University of Limerick uh, directly observed the crystal growth process from organic molecules. The fluorophenamic acid crystals nucleating and growing into the facet crystals and the related morphologies were recorded and analyzed in detail. And the structure of the organic crystals was also in situ determined by diffraction pattern. And understanding those early stage of the organic crystals growth, it's very important to fine tune the process, for example, in drug delivery. And Dr. Uh, Rena Ruiz Price and Professor Giuseppe Battaglia from UCL developed a novel technique, namely the Browning single particle analysis to determine the three-dimensional morphology of proteins in liquid states. And then the reconstruction results are compatible with that from X-ray. Their technique will expand the structural biology into the dynamic studies. Okay, let's make a conclusion. The stream system employs the unique holder and also the MEMS chip, the flow design. So the flow stream system can solve the limitations in conventional LPTM. Now we can reach the real fluidic control and we can control the liquid thickness. Uh, the experimental is, experiment is flexible and also we can get the safer operation we can reduce the beam in effect on the liquid experiment. For example, to remove the bubbles and the beam induced species or depositions. We can also reduce the possible contamination and lead to reproducible results. And all these uh, advantages are essential to obtain reliable LPTM results. And finally, I would like to take this chance to thank all our customers and the collaborators. Thanks a lot for all your great support and uh, valuable feedback. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, well, Hong Yu, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, we will now go over to the Q&A. And the first question is from Vita. She actually had uh, two questions. One of them was if you can share the parameters and one was about uh, the bubbles. So I will just uh, look up uh, Vita and I'll give her the microphone. So Vita, you're now online and you can ask your questions. And Vita, are you there? All right. Um, I will, yeah, I see a question mark now. Um, my microphone does not work. Okay, so I will ask your question uh, for you. Um, so Hong Yu, the first one is uh, that uh, Vita wanted to uh, ask you to specify the TM uh, parameters in the dendrite formation example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for this uh, uh, dendrite formation, you can just observe it in stem mode, but also you can do it in TM mode. Yeah. So here is in stem mode. The dose rate we used is about 50 electron per nanometer square, nanometer square and per second. And because if you increase the dose rate over the energy flux, it could be better, it could be benefit for improving the signal, but it also just induces the side reactions, for example, the beam induced depositions. So we just choose this uh, energy flux. Yeah. Okay. So for, the, that... for the TM of stand emission, the energy flux is very important. So I hope that answers. The question, uh, the next question of Vita was, if a bubble is still stuck in the system and does not move, how to proceed? <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
So here you have two different uh, methods to remove the bubbles. The firstly is uh, you have you can just uh, uh, increase the flow rate, uh, just remove the bubbles from the liquid cell, and also you can dissolve in the liquid the bubbles by applying the uh, different in, uh, potential from the inlet or outlet. And if you see how the bubbles inside, and then you can just uh, do the pulse uh, pressure control. For example, you can set the positive pressure uh, on, off, on, off in this way, in several cycles. And then it is possible to remove those bubbles. Yeah. All right. So I hope that answers your questions. And then I will go over to the next one. And that is from Esmael uh, about measuring. And I think it's about ELS. But we will ask, uh, we'll try to give the mic over. Yes. So you are now online. You can ask your question, Esmael. Hello. Hey. Uh, yeah, this, my question is about the EIS, about the impedance spectroscopy. Have you oh, tried to yes. your EIS in this setup? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how is the response? Because I guess the working electrode surface is, is like a dendrite and it is a bit different from the normal working electrode. Did you compare the result with the normal electrochemical setup? Uh, sorry, what do you mean? The normal uh, electrode, like like a flat surface, you know. Oh, yeah. Because I think. Yeah. yeah so here we just uh, designed this kind of uh, electrodes, working electrodes with a branch. Yeah. So this is uh, favorable for you to align because here on the bottom, the black part mm -hmm. that is the uh, window on the bottom, and also you have a window on the top. And it's crossed. So if you have the branches, it is helpful for you to align the two chips, and then you can see the crossed window. But if you only have one branch, one branch, and uh, on the elect on the on the bottom chip, on the bottom window, it could be difficult okay. for you to find the working electrode just exactly there. And uh, about the your ERS. We also uh, have the ERS, uh, measured the ERS to just detect a different uh, impedance. Uh, but sorry, I didn't put it in these uh, slides, but I can share you after that. We can discuss after yeah. that. Yeah. Be nice. Yeah, and also uh, I think the ERS is uh, uh, very helpful to detect the beam effect in the electrolyte. We have tried before just. Uh, uh, flow different uh, solutions with a different uh, ion uh, uh, strengths so that we can just uh, mimic uh, the beam effect. So at a different uh, solutions with different uh, uh, pH or different ion strengths, you measure the ERS and then simulate it with the circuit and then you can get the different component of the impedance. And then you can divide the impedance that is could be influenced by the beam in the real TM experiments. So we, we can use this way to mimic the beam effect. Thank you. And how is the, the, the resistivity of the setup in different pH ranges, like in KOH or in super ICD? Uh, you mean the conductivity? The resistivity, I mean, uh, oh, okay. not, not terms of electrochemistry, I mean the mechanical stability. Are they stable in like a KOH or uh, very alkaline solution? So uh, first about, uh, I can answer about the mechanical uh, stability. So we have tested this membrane uh, strength. If we just uh, manually input the different gas pressure, it can sustain about a five bar pressure inside. Uh, for the electrolyte, you can, for the natural solution, its pH value, uh, 
set around seven is not possible. And we also test the pH value with acid or alkaline solutions. And uh, recently we have a paper, it will come out quick. We tested the HN of the particle at a different temperature. And we flow the alkaline solution, the sodium oxygen um, hydrogen. And the pH value is seven, uh, is 13.8. So it's safe, you can do experiments. But for the KWH, you should be very careful. I know some people may be very interested in the electrocatalyst, for example, in the alkaline solution by using it as an electrolyte. Because the silicon, the, the, the chip is made by silicon, and you have the inlet outlet here. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, if you have the yeah, the liquid just go from the bottom here, it's very easily to reach the silicon. So the silicon mm -hmm. is not stable, just can be aged by KWH. So you should be very careful. But if you still want to do experiments, you can just code the backside of the hole with some other, for example, the some other kind of materials, some for example, the oxides or something is QH resistant. So you still can do these experiments. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Uh, the next question uh, about uh, the membrane thickness. I will see in Sultanat. Yes, Sultanat, you now have the microphone to ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for the presentation. And uh, my question is the following. Uh, yeah. I know that except the liquid thickness uh, in uh, electrochemical chip or any chip uh, in TM, the membrane thickness is also uh, known to affect the resolution. And uh, I would like to ask, uh, what is the membrane material you haven't mentioned, if I'm not mistaken? And uh, what is the thickness of uh, membrane? Uh, okay, so the, currently the membrane material is silicon nitride, so mm -hmm. it is just a MEMS uh, compatible, so it's very mm -hmm. it's, uh, easy to fabricate it in the clean room. And yes. the thickness of the membrane is uh, we used for the liquid experiments is 50 nanometer. Of course, you can mm -hmm. also decrease the thickness by changing the processing uh, methods, the processing in the clean room. It's possible. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. The next question from our distributor, Dominic. So, Dominic, you also have the mic now. Um, actually, my name is Martin, but <laughs> I don't know why it says Dominic. Uh, I, anyways, um, yeah, I, I, I was just curious if you could uh, comment on some cleaning procedures um, of, the, of the whole cell um, or give any experience with it. OK. So generally, after any experiments, you should uh, clean the system as soon as possible. So the general um, procedure to clean the system. So after experiments, you have to uh, remove the nano cell from the, the the chip, and then mount with a dummy chip. It's made by the metal, and you have the channels inside the dummy chip. And after that, you can flow the system with the uh, DI water or ultra pure water. And uh, you can dilute, uh, just clean with the water several times. Uh, generally, we can use uh, two uh, milliliter of water. And the process it can last about uh, half an hour. And after that, you can just uh, use the gas, dry gas, to clean, to flap, to blurring the whole system, uh, the tubing inside, and to dry the system. So, yeah, that is. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, then there was a question of uh, Pradeep. He has left, but I will ask the question for him so he can listen to the answer afterwards. Uh, he asks, how does viscosity affect on the data collection and on the setup? So I guess the, the answer is, so we there are different solutions, liquids with different viscosity. So um, to answer how, the, how it affects the setup, so we have a flow meter. A flow meter needs to be cal calibrated for different viscosity. So the difference uh, in the setup, it means that, well, the setup will stay the same, 
but the uh, the flow meter should be recalibrated for different uh, solution with different viscosity. Um, but in terms of um, uh, well collection data collection, it should not affect any. Uh, well, basically, it doesn't have any effect on the data collection. Yeah. So my question is like, uh, uh, what is the lifetime of this holder or uh, this chip? Uh, you mean the chip of the holder and, and this holder? Uh, so I, I do not know whether the chip uh, can be means uh, replaced or not. Uh, whether the holder or uh, holder has to be replaced or chip has to be replaced, I don't know. But uh, whatever. So w what is the lifetime of this chip? So for, liquid cell chip. Yeah, for each set of chip, it depends on your experiments first. Uh, for example, if only you play with the water, yes, no other samples, and you do experiments very carefully, and you can repeat it, use it next time. There's no problem. And I also told that uh, the um, the pressure inside can sustain about five bar, so the the membrane is very rigid. But if you do some other experiments, for example, you just uh, drop casting your sample, your uh, very special sample on it, and after experiments, of course, you can clean it. If you fail, it is acceptable, or the cleanness is acceptable. You can do it even the, if the membrane is still okay. No, I mean to say that uh, the some experiments may you you can assume that. It may happen in six molar of KOH. Some experiment uh, may be doing in the one molar of H2SO4. So different kind of electrolytes, different molarities. So uh, what is the possibility and uh, the means of what is actual uh, the li lifetime means minimum to maximum. Okay. What is the range? Yeah, it depends on your electrolyte, as you said. If you use water, yes. or just a natural solution, it's stable for a very long time. I didn't me measure, but uh, could be uh, mo several months, could be okay. But uh, if you okay. use an uh, alkaline solution, for example, the uh, KOH, so it's yes. uh, not stable because the KOH will age the silicon uh, behind. But if you mm. just if you use a different uh, um, concentration, so you can just increase the using time. And I also used the sodium oxygen uh, hydrogen solution with the pH value is 13.8. The experiments can last about six to eight hours. Yeah. OK, OK, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Yeah, done. OK, thank you very much. So we will go over to Yulia, who had an interesting question about uh, the electron, the influence of the electron beam. So Yulia, are you there? Yeah, hi, hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. This is a very nice presentation, and uh, my question is about the effect of the electron beam on the uh, electrochemical conditions. Because uh, I'm thinking about, uh, for example, experiments where you need a precise control of the current flow or you need a precise control of the potential on the electrode. Uh, how can yeah. you control that with the electron beam also interacting? So, okay. Uh, because uh, you use the beam uh, to observe the process. So it's impossible to completely, completely remove the beam effect. So the only way is just to reduce the beam effect to in, in your acceptable uh, level. So before doing experiments, you can just uh, test the uh, different dose rate of a different uh, energy flux. How any energy flux affect your experiments? Then you can choose a suitable energy flux by changing the uh, spot size, by inserting the different uh, apertures inside, for example. Here, in this experiment, we, I want to do the electrode deposition. I want to see the growth of dendrites of the smooth layer on the working electrode. But before I apply any uh, potential, there are already some depositions here. 
So it means that those rates over the energy flux is too high. And then I have to reduce it. Yeah. And if you also want to study how the beam and it, uh, affect your experiments, you can also move your beam to another area. So this is your field of view. And then you can put uh, move your beam to the another new area. So that is the area without the beam irradiation. You can compare the, the positions on the electrode and to see the composition or morphology change. Then this is also a way to evaluate the beam effect. Okay, and the the interaction of the beam um, from the sense of the current that it might induce in the electrochemical signal, then it's predictable, right? It just depends on the beam energy. Yeah. Ah, perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So the next question is from Seung Yong Lee, if I say it correct, about the liquid thickness. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, actually, the last question brought up a, a new question to me. So uh, you said that uh, like you can flow gas to push out the liquid, and does it mean that it can be that the stream holder can be also used as as the uh, environmental holder? Well, in a way, the, the, the holders are pretty similar, uh, but uh, while well, there are some differences, like difference between the liquid holder and the gas holder, but overall, yeah, you can, you can uh, I guess, uh, in the general terms, substitute liquid holder for, uh, for, for gas and gas holder for liquid. So does it mean uh, there is no kind of like, uh, like explosion of the, uh, like, uh, break, break of the cells, like, because of these no, no, different... No, 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 no. No, uh, there is no explosion just because the uh, well. First of all, we we test the chips. So when, when the either liquid or gas goes inside, we test the chips, uh, the membrane especially because it's most sensitive part. We test for with the overpressure of I don't know, four four to five bars, while the working pressure is just one bar. Okay, so then, then what, what 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 makes the uh, difference between the electric electro uh, environmental holder and then liquid holder? Could you? uh well basically it's it's more like a control it's more control of, of uh, either the gas or liquid it's done differently and okay. also the the, uh, the tubing is different and we will now continue um with a question of uh, drew um so the question of drew is what is the best way for measuring beam dose and quantifying determining which observation uh, observations arise from beam damage and which arise from the application of potential. Okay, so the best way to measure the dose rate, the real value, so you need a flatter uh, curve to measure the, the current, the beam current on the screen. And then you can divide it by the, the area uh, uh, or emitting area. That is the very uh, accurate uh, uh, dose rate value. But for the simple uh, or the simple evaluation, you can just read it out from the uh, the TEM screens or TEM the, the, the software. But that one is not uh, so accurate. But if you just want to compare the trend, the low dose rate, medium or higher one. It can also use in this way. And uh, for the another experiment, uh, another you know, another uh, question, you know how to distinguish the beam induced effect uh, with the real potential, right? Uh, potential induced. So yeah, so you can just uh, firstly you can um, don't apply any potential and uh, keep this emitting condition and to see what will happen. And then at this condition, you can apply the potential. So in this way, you can just study how those uh, two uh, factors affect your experiments. But uh, as uh, most in my experience, uh, sometimes these two things are coupled. It's difficult to, to uh, evaluate clearly. Uh, for example, at a lower uh, dose rate, 
then you have the uh, depositions. And it seems there is no uh, effect on the depositions. But actually, you always add additional electrons from the beam. So you have some effect, but it depends on your detection uh, limitation or your acceptance level. Uh, one more person is here, and that is uh, Chao Ying, if all is well. So can you, uh, is yes. your microphone working now? Yeah, you're welcome. Yes, good morning. Thank you for the excellent uh, presentation. I, I have a question about the electrodes. So I do understand probably you use uh, platinum. Um, do you have other electrodes, for example, gold? Glassy carbon or any others? Yeah, so uh, um, we will let's say we currently use only platinum, but uh, uh, in the near future we'll have other electrodes. Okay, now another question following that uh, gas, gas um, pumping gas into the system. So if that's the case, do you have such, such sort of like separate pump for pumping gas and the valve system for that? Or just how how do you actually put gas into the lipid? Um, um, yeah, so I can answer. So uh, this, so you see you see on the screen. So what we have we have actually special uh, pumps. So it's pumps for uh, uh, basically pumping the pressure, and the pressure pushes the liquid in and out. So on one side we have actually two pressure pumps. One uh, we have uh, one pressure pump on the inlet, one pressure pump on the outlet. That I do understand. But for, for the gas phase a pump pumping into the liquid, uh, I would assume you would have a separate uh, tubing for uh, sort of like uh, for mixing because of the fact I'm not sure how you actually do that. So well, basically we have uh, uh, well, let's say you can say half half of the system has it just you have the pressure, but basically the gas environment, and the end point basically you have a, a tube where you have both the, the gas and the liquid, and then from from the basically this the small uh, for example container where your your solution is, uh, this only uh, a liquid tubing. So basically we push the pressure, uh, well, basically the gas, and the then the gas pushes liquid. Okay. So just basically, it's a different. Uh, we have different tubings that in one. Uh, let's say uh, we have larger tubing for gas, and we have smaller tubings for liquid. Okay. A little bit detailed question also. Say when you do the the cap covering that particular cell, you have O rings. So, for example, if we wanted to put specific modification onto the electrode, for example, on the um, platinum electrode, if I use fib focused ion beam to weld a piece of material onto the electrode, I then put on the, the cap, is that a possibility? So yeah, actually, so the one you just put the uh, an image, so this is a fib lamella uh, of uh, aluminum, I think magnesium alloy that we use for, uh, uh, for corrosion studies. So this is fib prepared lamella. Excellent. Okay. I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Maybe it's nice to follow up one more question of Jennifer who has already left, but uh, following up this one, she asked, she asked uh, if we offer both two electrode and three electrode designs and if our system is compatible, compatible with all potential stats. So that's maybe a nice one also to get into. So currently uh, the chips we provide uh, three electrode uh, uh, system here. Yeah. And of course, you can also use it for two electrodes, uh, design, uh, two electrodes uh, uh, measurements. And uh, all those uh, uh, chip, chips design, and you can connect to any kinds of uh, potential state because we provide a kind of IC, uh, HCU and to connect the uh, holder. And the other uh, side connect to your uh, potential state. Yeah, so it's uh, compatible with a different kinds of potential state. So if I may add, so basically what we provide, what the Honyu means, we provide an, like a special interconnect unit. It's like interface between the holder and whatever the potential, potential set you have. 
Yes. Okay, uh, I hope that answers uh, her question. There was one somebody asked uh, first the, sea, the copper layer is deposited and then dendrites grow over it. So, because we apply the potential, the cyclic photometry, this is, means the positive potential and then go to negative, go to positive, just the period like this. So, in the negative potential, you provide the driving force to deposit the ions on the electrode. But on the inverse scanning, of when you apply the positive potential, the metals on the electrode can be oxidized and means dissolved into the electrolyte. So that is the agent. Okay, so we have one, two more questions coming in. So I will just keep uh, keep going. Seyong, you have the microphone again. Uh, so uh, actually, I, I have one more question. So uh, most of the data, actually all of the data shown here are uh, based on like potential static uh, like photometry or something, but is that possible to apply current bias uh, instead? Uh, so uh, what do you mean the current biasing? So now, uh, like like that data, it was like uh, the cyclic photometry, like yes. applying potential bias, but is that possible to apply current bias as well? Like yeah, because yeah, yeah, it, is, yeah. it, is, it is more sensitive, you know, because yes. it is more difficult. Yeah, it's right. So any of the uh, electro analyze and analytical technique in your potential state, for example, chrono altimetry, ERS, yeah, also the chrono potential, and you can also apply it. Yeah, you can do it. We have some examples here. I, I'm sorry, I can I didn't put it here, but if you are interested, we can share. Yeah, can, I can share with you after that. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, and I guess one last question of Chao Ying. You have the microphone now. Yeah. Yeah, you're just uh, talking about the uh, grounding. So this kind of hold is sometimes is pretty delicate to get specific uh, curve. The loop. If you ground the holder, ground the electrode, the effect could be different. Do you have uh, what kind of options do you have for grounding the holders? Yes. Uh, because uh, uh, for most of TM uh, shell, you always have two volt uh, potential. And if your grounding is not appropriate, you can apply this biosing on your electrolyte. And then you, if you even you don't apply any biosing, you already have the depositions on the electrode. So in our uh, treatment, we just uh, using the, uh, how do you say the, uh, uh, connect the holder and also connect the, the, the we have the uh, specific uh, uh, cable to connect the holder and to the TM and also to the potential state. So that is uh, a closed circuit. So in this way, we can avoid the uh, additional two volt uh, effect from the TM itself. Okay. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Okay, and with that, we come to the end of this Nano Talk. Thank you all for watching, and I invite you to follow us on our social media accounts, LinkedIn uh, and Twitter, foremostly, and also subscribe to our newsletter, so you will always uh, be informed if we will organize a new webinars. And um, well, this was it. Thank you for watching and see you soon.